Hello and welcome everybody to our first virtual lunchtime discovery series presentation. Thanks for being here everybody. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Chris. I am your host for the lunchtime discovery series brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within our Department of Environmental Quality and hosted by us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Many thanks to the folks in the Office of Environmental Education who I know are watching right now uh, for working with us at the museum to put this on. This is a great collaboration that we've put together for the last little while bringing this program to you. Normally we're inside the SECU Daily Planet Theater, which is this part of the museum <laughs> right here inside the big globe where we bring our guest speakers and we learn about what's going on in science, nature, and the environment. And now that we're all sort of not inside the museum, we've been looking at ways to bring these programs to you and I think we got it figured out now. So Wednesdays at noon, we will be right here on YouTube bringing you the Lunchtime Discovery Series once more. If you're out there and you're pursuing your North Carolina Environmental Education certification, then these lectures count. Hit up the folks with the Office of Environmental Education for information on how you can get your continuing education credits. That's right, this one can count. So make sure that you're doing that as well. And uh, I'll drop links in the chat box a little bit later in the program where you can find our archive of these programs uh, so that you can go back and watch past presentations that we did live inside the theater. And you can sign up for the EE newsletter where you can get updates on our future presentations that we'll be doing uh, here virtually until we can all safely get back inside the museum once again. Today, my guest is Marcus Gray. He's the Director of Conservation Initiatives with Audubon International. We are going to be talking about pollinators, pollinator habitat, and maybe habitat in some unlikely places, places you might not be thinking about putting pollinator habitat. Marcus, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us uh, at agreeing to, to do the show virtually today. It's kind of cool because you're not actually in North Carolina, which means we could grab you from anywhere for the show. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, all of this coronavirus, uh, you know, the pandemic hit, but I was actually speaking with staff about coming down and, and visiting there in person. But, um, you know, better to do it this way than not at all. <laughs> I mean, this is great, right? Because yeah. you can do this from the, the comforts of your own home. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My background is a closet. If anybody's, interested, but, <laughs> you know, I, we're supposed to have rain here um, starting up any time. So I was going to try to do this outside in my pollinator garden. But um, you know, if anybody has any questions about anything, I'd be happy to, to answer those. But unfortunately, it's, it's just not going to work to be outside <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> well, maybe, you, uh, maybe later we'll uh, we'll work that one out for the future. How we can okay. have a garden chat. That'd be good. <laughs> we'll have an environmental education garden party. There we go. Right here on YouTube. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and turn the show over to you and you can launch into your presentation. Everybody sit back, grab some snacks, maybe, and let's enjoy the show. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that. Looks good. All right. So like Chris said, I'm, I'm Marcus Gray. I'm the Director of Conservation Initiatives for Audubon International. Uh, I'm a wildlife biologist. I actually grew up in Virginia and I, I do have some ties to North Carolina. So it's good to be speaking with, with everyone uh, in the Tar Heel State. And I'm just sorry we can't be there in, in person. But a lot of what I work on these days is creating pioneer habitats, working with golf courses through our program, what we call uh, Monarchs in the Rough. And we call it Monarchs in the Rough because it was an interesting name, but Really, it should be, you know, pollinator habitat in places where you don't care so much about and you have room. <laughs> um, so it's it's looking at these out of play areas, out of the way areas, odd places, just like you might on a farm. A golf course has plenty of places like, you know, along cart paths or in uh, roundabouts, you know, little turnarounds out by the maintenance shop, the formal beds even around the clubhouse. So there's lots of places where this pollinator habitat can be, can be put in. You know, the picture here in the background, you can see a, a fairly diverse mix of, of grasses and forbs and then the the, the intensively maintained um, golf course portion in the, in the background. Let's 
slide in. One second. Let's see if having a little bit of a so we need to actually start the presentation. We'll get it figured out. Don't worry. Yeah. No, I don't know why it's not. Hmm. Sorry about that, everybody. I said we had it figured out, but well, I uh, thought we did. We'll be able to go. Here we go. All right. So if you're not familiar with Audubon International, um, we're a, an independent nonprofit uh, that works really you know, pri primarily with golf courses, but really as a third party reviewer for these for certification programs for environmental practices. Um, so we will take um, information from different businesses and, and what they're doing to improve you know, water quality and, and other aspects of what their uh, operation could impact. And um, offer certification programs for that. So there's different levels and different programs depending on what type of business. And like I said, we primarily work with golf courses, but our mission here is to deliver high quality environmental education and facilitate the sustainable management of natural resources in all the places that people live, work, and play. Um, so we have programs for um, hospitality industry, you know, like hotels, um, uh, private clubs, golf courses, sustainable communities, um, just, just basically anything that you, you might think of where people are interested in, in getting some recognition for the good work that they're doing. So we have these positive impacts at multiple geographic scales, you know, everything from the individual property all the way up to the landscape level and then even, even globally. Uh, this is just a map here representing where our members are at. M most of them are in the United States, but we do have uh, an international focus. And we were the global leader in this certification, especially for golf courses. So if you look, you know, we, we go all the way from Australia, all the way across the globe. Uh, with our with our membership. And so with the golf courses, we had this cooperative sanctuary program. So we treat golf courses almost like a network of reserves uh, to provide these ecological services. So not just wildlife habitat, but uh, water quality, um, education outreach. So it's a network that works together um, on the landscape to help provide these benefits in tandem, in addition to just on the individual, individual property. So we have we have 31 certified golf courses in North Carolina, many more members. You, know, you, you pay to be a member, but to be certified is free, but you get our technical assistance and, and, and guidance to help with your certification process um, when you become a member. And the Monarch initiative that we have really is, it fits into the operation and, and shows people in a microcosm what our certification entails. Because as everyone on here may or may not know, the pollinator habitat has benefits in addition to creating just habitat for butterflies. You know, you improve water infiltration, um, you know, compared to other landscape types, you know, whether you're talking about a, a parking lot, or even intensively managed turf, water moves through the, the, the soil much easier in a, in a native planting than it does say on intensively managed ground. Um, you know, we're providing the habitat, which is the obvious one. We're reducing chemical use and improving the safety of, of that by having buffers around water, uh, um, around um, bodies of water and that gets us into water conservation and water quality and then education outreach you can get people out on the property to see what you're doing learn about the environment you know take a bird walk um, do a butterfly count uh, look at frogs and toads you know any, any sorts of thing you might want to get kids to teach kids about metamorphosis for example um, uh, we you know, catch tadpoles and they watch them turn into toads that sort of thing um, so these are the six criteria that we look at primarily um, and then it, it, there are courses that are doing above and beyond this, but this is the base of our, our certification and everything that we look at. So I'm just going to run through some of these fairly quickly um, and, you know, let me know if we have any questions. And then, um, you know, we're working on a standards update right now uh, that should be published here um, probably in the next month or two. Um, just, an, uh, just an update because so much has changed since the last, the previous version was done, especially with green infrastructure. You know, think about rain gardens and bioswales and you know, all the, all the storm water management uh, practices that are now available. We added some about prescribed fire. Um, we're even, maybe, maybe not this version, but the, the next version, we're going we're gonna to delve more into energy because there's a big push for solar energy, you know, ground mounted solar uh, on golf courses. Um, and so we're going to try to see how we can fit all these things together in operations and, and um, provide technical assistance and then uh, just good information for our members about these different practices. 
So environmental planning, this is the thing that we encourage courses to do first. You, know, you develop this list of, of anticipated activities, you prioritize those projects and you set achievable goals on a timeline and you, you make sure you track your progress uh, so things don't fall through the cracks. Um, but you can complete those projects in any order, but you have to do this planning first. And then the other criteria, you know, if you want to do water quality first, you can work on water quality. If you want to work on chemical use reduction, like you need a new wash pad and a catchment system for your equipment, um, you know, you can do that first. But this one has to be, the environmental planning section has to be done first so you have a roadmap of where you're going to be when you're done with all this. Um, and, you know, courses may find it easier to tackle one major criteria at a time. Like if you have a major renovation, like you're going to redo your entire irrigation system, you know, that's going to take precedence over, uh, you know, maybe a new pamphlet, a brochure about uh, birds on the property. You know, so it just, it all depends on uh, what the focus may be at the property at that particular time. So like if you look at this picture, uh, you know, this golf course is surrounded primarily by woods. Um, and increasingly, you'll see a golf course is surrounded by development. So, you know, the things that might impact this property would be different than one that'd be in a more urban setting or suburban setting. But, you know, look at all the trees around the outside of where the, where the actual play area is. And, like, there's a lot of room for environmental projects, uh, whether you're talking about bird boxes, you know, thinning to increase uh, habitat for something like bobwhite quail, um, you know, rare and endangered plant surveys. There's lots of areas where uh, that work can take place that's not going to even come close to interfering with the golf course operation. So this is the one that we're going to focus on today, you know, is wildlife, ha wildlife and habitat management. Uh, we have a, a raptor relocation program where we're moving birds of prey from airports to member golf courses. Right now in the New York City area and the San Francisco area, those are the airports that we've started with. Um, but we're always looking to expand uh, if we can find a way to support that. So like if, if Charlotte or, you know, one of the airports that are closer to Raleigh were interested in this type of thing, you know, it's, it's a win-win. We move birds away from where they could be potentially struck by aircraft. So it's a human health and safety benefit and a, a wildlife benefit. So that's, that's all well and good. But, you know, native bees, honeybees, we have a lot of golf courses getting into honeybees. Um, and the recommendation there is that they work with a trained beekeeper um, rather than starting their own program because you don't want to cause more problems than, than benefits uh, with the hive if you're not managing them properly. Uh, purple martins, bluebirds, uh, owl nest boxes, all very popular. And then the thing that people don't think about a lot is, is fisheries management. We've got a lot of water bodies on golf courses um, and there could be a, a additional attention put to, to fishing or you know youth fishing programs on uh, courses. And then if you want to talk about reptiles and amphibians, you know, maybe you want to keep fish out of the pond you know, so the frogs can reproduce uh, without having their their um, offspring eaten by the fish. So it just all depends on what your goal is and what you're trying to manage for. It's, it's difficult to manage for everything on the same acre, but um, there's lots of room on these golf courses uh, to provide this work. And there's, when I say lots of room, there's about 2.3 million acres in the United States uh, owned and managed by golf courses, but they only use 30% of that area for the actual game. So there's, you know, we, we think between 300 and 500,000 acres easily, you know, conservatively that habitat projects can take place just in the United States. So uh, this is a big one that people talk about a lot is you know how chemicals are used on a golf course. Um, like I said, there's 2.3 million acres controlled by golf courses. Well, there's 45 million acres of residential lawn to give you an idea of the scale of difference. Um, so the things that you do at home are just as important, if not more so. Um, you know, the golf course staff is trained. They've got uh, a state certification they have to maintain to use these chemicals. Um, and so we try to help them you know, with that, but also identify ways that they can reduce spraying, uh, create buffers around water bodies and, and protect uh, natural resources and, you know, making sure they only spray uh, when there's an actual problem. They don't just go through the motions of just a broadcast spraying on a certain date because a pest might be there. We want, the, we want a pest to actually be there. Um, spot spraying and scouting um, are very important. Um, and where you store these, where you store these chemicals, how you mix them, how you rinse your equipment, you know, what's your application rate uh, and frequency and, and um, you know, how, these pollinator plots, for example, are a good uh, example of a, a, a reduced or no spray zone, you know, because we don't want to be attracting pollinators to an area and then treat it with, uh, with a, an insecticide, um, you know, that's counter, counterproductive. Uh, and so buffers are really important. You know, we require that our members have at least 50% of the shoreline naturalized um, in in play areas, more for out of play areas. So if you might play across a body of water, you do have a little bit that you can shoot the ball across. 
but we do want to make sure that we have as big of a buffer, you know, as wide as a buffer as we can. What are your irrigation practices? Like, where does your water come from? You know, is it a private well? Is it surface water? Is it municipal water? Um, those are all considerations, and especially, you know, in a drought year in North Carolina, that could be an issue. But we work a lot with people in the Southwest as well, where water is an increasingly important issue, um, as you can imagine. And then other other BMPs to protect water quality, like I, I mentioned earlier, with the green infrastructure, rain gardens, things like that. Like, how can we improve the infiltration, reduce the sheet erosion and runoff that can cause uh, water quality problems down the, downstream? So outreach and education: How do you get people on the course? Um, seeing what you do, how you manage the golf course, and then also getting the benefits because golf courses are increasingly the last remaining open space in a lot of communities. I mean, I, I can tell you, you know, I, I grew up in Virginia. We used to go to North Carolina quite a bit to go to the Outer Banks. Um, but, you know, I've got a sister who lives outside of Raleigh and we go, you know, that town, I can't find anything. <laughs> Every time I go to Raleigh, there's a new, new subdivision and a new highway and I can't find. So, you know, just think about what the landscape was like just 15, 20 years ago compared to what it's like now, you know, the development is, is just gotten immense. And so um, golf courses are finding themselves hemmed in. And so they're having to require, they're required to provide all these ecological benefits we all need, you know, uh, the clean air, the clean water, the places to recreate, the wildlife habitat. It's all falling on the backs of these golf courses and what parks may be available. So it's, it's just the interesting dynamic that has come out of, of um, you know, everybody moving to the Southeast. But it's becoming a nationwide problem. It's you know we had a we were in San Antonio, Texas, a couple of years ago for a, a conference, and you know that city you fly in there you can't see the end of it. You just look out to the horizon. It's just just it keeps going, keeps going, and they're building more. You see the dust from the machinery building more. There's nothing in the way, um, so they're just expanding. And it's like that in the Midwest. It's like that in the Southeast. Um, things are just just built, being built up. So we have a lot of outreach and education ideas. You know people can work on their website. They can have a social media campaign, events on the golf course, everything from brochures, signs like the like the um, one you saw there with, you know, don't drive in this sensitive habitat, um, internal staff and interdepartmental training. So like a lot of these golf courses might have a hotel associated with them or a, an event venue. You know, if we plant pollinator habitat, we want to make sure the people that work for the venue don't weed eat it, you know. Um, so it's just just making sure there's that transfer of knowledge, like if, if a staff person leaves. Um, including guest lectures like we're doing today. Like how can you have people from the outside come, you know, and speak about important environmental programs uh, in, in their particular state? Like in North Carolina, if you want someone to talk about, um, you know, bank stabilization or, or um, you know, erosion problems on, in the coastal areas, or you want to talk about rare species, maybe, you know, freshwater mussels or salamanders from the western part of the state. You know, there's lots of, lots of things you could, you could talk about that might be of interest uh, to people. And then citizen science monitoring, which I'll mention again later on, is like, how can you get people involved to help quantify what's going on in the landscape, to measure the plant response, to count butterflies, to count birds. Um, and then there's actually a foundation called the First Green Foundation that teaches youth, uses golf courses as a, as a living laboratory to teach kids about the environment and, and, and stewardship practices. Um, and then, you know, when you get this certification done for your property, um, there's an environmental steward award for the compiler and we help with a press release and things like that. So we help bring recognition to the golf course uh, for the good things that they're doing. And like I said, it's not just, it's not just a feel good thing. We're not just mailing a certificate. Like we want to see their scouting records. We want to look at their, their pr what products they're using, what their application rate is, what their equipment is. We're, we require soil tests. We want to look at you know, how much water they're using and where it comes from. We want to know what species are already found. We have a bio blitz program. Uh, where people go out and count as many species as they can. Uh, there's a photo competition associated with that. Um, and then any other pertinent management protocols. But the big thing is we want to look at your, your chemical use and, and your soil tests to say like, okay, if you're fertilizing, um, you know, is that getting to the water? What's the residual amount of phosphorus and nitrogen in the soil? That type of thing. And um, we provide the, uh, down here at the bottom, we provide these booklets. It's a certification handbook and a guide to environmental stewardship on a golf course. So you might have you know, the things that you're doing in your operation, you might not think about, oh, well, I could do a bluebird trail. And so we have examples of other things that you could do that you maybe maybe didn't think about that come from your peers and other, other golf courses. So I had to throw a snake in here. I don't know, just get people's attention, make sure you're still awake. Um, so, and, and then the membership is just $300 uh, for courses here in the States. Um, like I said, we have this Raptor Relocation Program, which is mostly kestrels uh, right now, uh, especially during migration. 
And then you know, there's benefits to this. You, know, you get the science-based, mission-based credibility, you know, the street cred, as it were, marketing value. I mean, increasingly, golfers themselves are wanting to play on a course that is envir- has good environmental stewardship, um, they're doing things the right way. It's sort of like when you go in a hotel and you, you expect a little placard that says, hang up your towel, save the world. You know, and now people are starting to expect the same level of environmental attention on golf courses. Uh, you build relationships with the community. You know, we, we have situations where there might be misunderstandings about water use or chemical use or, uh, you know, any variety of, you know, mowing management or um, zoning. You know, and it's just better to have a good working relationship with your neighbors beforehand before anything comes up so they know what you're doing and why and vice versa. Um, you can take some of these practices off the golf course and provide a conservation benefit at other uh, municipal spaces, um, you know, public spaces, even corporate, you know, like a bank to put in a pollinator garden because they saw one on a golf course. Um, and then, you know, this business, business improvement competitive advantage, you know, if you're saving money by reducing your costs, you can reinvest that in the, in the operation and, and be more resilient into the future. So getting into butterflies a little bit more, uh, you know, they're in North Carolina. You have about 175 species on a regular basis, you know, decreasing variety northward as it gets cooler, you know, more seasonal. But um, the varied landscape in North Carolina, just like Virginia, where I grew up, really drives that diversity. You go from the ocean to the mountains, you know, and that Piedmont area is sort of this transitional zone where um, you just have a lot of different habitat types where you can support a wider range of, of different kinds of butterflies. Their grass is commonly eaten by caterpillars. People may not realize, and I, because I talk so much to golf course superintendents that manage grass, um, they, they get this, you know, it helps them see the benefits and the, the relationship between what they're doing and the natural world. So they're native grasses, but even, even um, things like poa and things in the, in the genus poa that they might actually be using for the golf course um, are, are supporting caterpillars, particularly of the skippers, which, you know, aren't true butterflies, but everybody considers them butterflies. Uh, when you're talking about pollinator management, um, they're, they're a little, little dog leg off the evolutionary tree there, but there are others, you know, this isn't an exhaustive list, but just keep in mind that, you know, these native grasses and even some introduced grasses um, are important for uh, caterpillar development. And they, these are the, these are the insects that use that. And I'm not going to read this list, but, you know, this just gives you an idea. Like there's, there's quite a range of species that use grasses. So whether it's in your yard, in a park, or in a golf course, you know, they, they're going to be making use of these grasses for the reproduction. So it's not all, it's not all flowers out there. You know, we, we do want to provide flowers for the aesthetics and, and the nectar sources for the adults, but the caterpillars need that food plant. So this is a point that I, I drive home a lot to land managers, um, whether a golf course or not. I said, you know, dozens of species are impacted by what you do or don't do every day. And so not doing something is a management action. And I know that you had uh, Dr. Nick Haydad on here um, last fall, and he talked about the lack of disturbance with, with the satyrs that he was studying at like Fort Bragg and places like that. And, you know, if this closed canopy forest that we have is not good butterfly habitat for most butterflies, uh, we want light getting to the ground, you know, savanna situation. You know, think about bobwhite quail habitat or turkey brood habitat. Um, you know, you want a lot of forbs you know, native wildflower broadleaves at the ground level, native grasses at the ground level. Um, and it's just hard to get that when the canopy is closed. Uh, we've restricted the use of fire. Um, so resetting that um, succession is, is more difficult. And so things have gotten reduced to the point now that it's tough to re-implement or reinstitute these practices because they're so restricted in their range. So you could you know, yes, fire might benefit a species, but if you burn the only place where they exist, you know, at once, all at once, you, you could knock them out. So that you'd be really careful with, with things like fire and disturbance, but we need it. We need more of it across the landscape, maybe do adjacent to a known site rather than the known site until you get them moved over there. But there's, there's definitely uh, a need for this disturbance and, and not doing something does have uh, impacts. This mulberry wing skipper, but anyway, so, and there are larger butterflies that use grasses. You know, and these are, a lot of these are considered forest interior. It's t- uh, so to contradict what I was just saying, <laughs> there are, you know, the, the obverse of that is that, you know, this, um, there are butterflies that we consider to be more forest interior, but I think historically they were more in these little openings in the forest, um, you know, where a tree falls down or there's a glade, like a, a wetland 
um, they a lot of their caterpillars eat um, sedges, things like that. But but they also use grasses and bottle brush grasses, one you'll find in the woods. Um, and you know, they, they, it's just you can't you can't manage for everything on the same acre. But we need more acres managed for something rather than just a closed canopy pine stand, uh, unfortunately. So that's you know we all like paper, but there is also um, you know we need to have some other considerations, you know, multiple use type considerations when we're, when we're managing large landscapes. And even wet sites, you know, here's a list of butterflies that use like wetlands around, you know, a ring of vegetation around a pond um, or a, a wet spot, a seep uh, or, some, or, you know, a place, uh, a marsh, you know, there's, there's several options um, that you can run into. So like there's some butterflies you can't find unless you go wading around in a salt, salt marsh. Um, they're just not gonna be anywhere else. And here's a list, uh, just a sample list of some caterpillar food plants. Um, again, I'm not going to read all these, but things that, you know, they're tied to specific butterflies. Um, a lot of, a lot of, some introduced plants, some native, some that people don't find too uh, friendly, like nettles and thistles. Um, you know, but they do, you know, this nettles support red admiral butterflies, thistles support a wide variety, but pro provide a lot of nectar for uh, swallowtails in particular. So it's, you know, you try to manage for the native where you can, obviously, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to have a, a known uh, noxious weed and promoting that because that can cause other problems. But you, you know, if you can, if, if you have a relatively benign native thistle, you, you know, you can keep it. Um, and so this will all be recorded. So if you want to go back and reference this later, um, you can. So there's some common golf course butterflies, the red emerald in the upper right that I mentioned. Um, this is a silver spotted skipper on the upper left. They actually feed on, on legumes, uh, a common buckeye in the bottom left and uh, an American copper, one that we may think may even was introduced uh, with settlement, but we, you know, because it's very similar genetically to the European uh, counterpart. So, um, you know, these are, these are butterflies you see in any, any garden. I mean, if you look at the top picture with the red emerald, it's actually on a butterfly bush. Um, so it's just, you know, some, some, if you drill down and look closely, these things are a lot more colorful maybe than, than people realize, you know, not everything's a monarch. I hear that all the time. I saw a monarch. I saw a baby monarch. No, 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 <laughs> just because it's orange doesn't mean it's a, it's a monarch, but there's, you know, like I said, there's 175 species, lots to learn. You can be a lifelong student with this. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, uh, you know, to wrinkle the brain it might be better than a crossword puzzle. Um, so, you know, there's swallowtails, there's, you know, quite a few species of swallowtail. Um, down where you're at in North Carolina, you pick up one called the um, Palamedes swallowtail. Their, their caterpillars actually eat Sweet Bay, um, which, you know, the Southeastern, you know, Hampton Roads, Virginia, is really the northernmost extent of their range, but a lot of the country gets these others, spicebush swallowtail, eastern tiger, uh, black swallowtail, zebra swallowtail, and I, I put the host plants there in parentheses, um, and then the pipe vine swallowtail, which is aptly named because their caterpillars eat, eat uh, pipe vine or, or Dutchman's pipe, which spicebush is also aptly named, they eat sassafras and spicebush. So this is actually a picture from an opening in a, in a pine stand uh, down in, in extreme Southeast Virginia, at Big Woods Wildlife Management Area, so very similar to a lot of Eastern North Carolina, where you see the, cat, the butterflies are, are, are getting imbibing nutrients from the roadside. A lot of prescribed fire in that part of the state. And there's hair streaks, you know, they're, they're the ones with the tails, they move their wings like this, they have fake, fake eye spots on their backside. Um, I the hope there is that a predator will attack the wrong end and they'll be able to live another day. Um, but they use a variety of host plants, including trees like oaks and hickories, red cedar, and they like to get nectar from mints and blueberries and red buds. So that really spring, you know, early, early blooming plants, you'll, you'll find um, hair streaks. And this is a gray hair streak, very common butterfly uh, in North Carolina. Fritillaries, you know, uh, variegated fritillary on the right here, they use passion flower or may pop, as you call it there in North Carolina, um, that grows in, in native and restored sites and in private gardens. People like passion flowers because they have a very tropical looking flower on them. And then um, great spangled fritillary on the left, actually on a non-native plant. But anyway, the, they, um, you'll see them you know, right now. There's, there's a lot of great spangled fritillary flying uh, at this time of year. And then like I mentioned, the silver spotted skipper, you know, don't forget the legumes. You know, planting clover in your yard, you know, converting your lawn to clover isn't necessarily a bad thing. It, you know, this plant provides both, both the caterpillar food and a nectar source, just like milkweed does, uh, provides for the monarch caterpillar. A lot of clover and vetches and sennas will support all stages of the life cycle. You just, you might need um, 
more, you, you want more variety to have a longer bloom time, but, but they do produce um, things that the butterfly needs for the entire life cycle, which is, you know, interesting The things adapt, adapt you know, co-evolved with this plant um, that supplies all their needs. And then there's, there's rarities, you know, increasingly like, you know, Dr. Headed talked about uh, the Seder, uh, St. Francis Seders there in North Carolina, but things like the Regal Fritillary, the like grasslands were a lot more extensive, prairies, even east of the Mississippi River um, were much more common. They were almost everywhere. Um, now they're restricted just to two sites, one in Pennsylvania and one in, in Southwest Virginia. Um, the model dusky wing has been extirpated from New England and it's moving down. You know, it's, it's losing its, its habitat as you get closer to the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast. And then this Carner Melissa Blue, you know, like that Pine Oak Savannah, there, there's a lot of butterflies in that, that like that same habitat. Uh, sweet that you know that same community that's just not available anymore and and we're finding a lot of interesting things like as ranges shift with temperatures changing and precipitation patterns changing um and some of them are counterintuitive because you know because butterflies are uh ectothermic you know they get their their heat from the environment um to a point being warmer is beneficial as long as the rain doesn't change and your host plant doesn't dry out and your nectar sources die um you know so to a point to a point it's better to be warmer but then then it starts to fall apart when it gets too warm. You, you get asynchronous, you know, you're not flying at the same time that your nectar sources are blooming, you know, so things get out of whack. But um, you know, we're actually seeing northerly species move south right now, which is counterintuitive just because butterflies like heat. Um, but that's not going to be a long-term beneficial strategy, uh, I don't believe. So um, yeah, so just be mindful that there are butterflies that are declining, um, not, just, not just ones you might hear about. Um, and then I've got this list of nectar plants. Adult butterflies will use a variety of flowers um, to, to get nectar from. Um, but this, this is a list, it's mostly native. And I threw a couple introduced, a few introduced at the bottom just because they're annuals and they're fairly benign uh, in the landscape, they'll die back. But um, this list will be available as well. But you know, the whole thing, which my next slide is, is you wanna have blooms that encompass the entire growing season, you know, red buds to asters. So like, as early as you can in March, you know, where you're at in North Carolina, uh, late February, early March, all the way through to frost. And if you don't get a frost, it's good for you. Yeah, you, you have like year-round butterflies. But, um, you know, you definitely want to provide different shapes and colors or phenology, as it's called, and plant in, in, in groups of light colors because the way butterflies see, it's easier than to see a, 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 a patch of something that, rather than an individual plant. Um, and you just want to provide for that entire life cycle, like I mentioned. You want to have the caterpillar food plant, but then enough nectar for the adults to use um, as well. So this is a, a formal garden. Um, it's actually getting a little dry, but you see different heights and colors and sizes and shapes of, of flowers. So the more diversity you have in your planting, the more species of both bees and butterflies and other insects you're going to support. And birds, you know, these are all, a lot of these are good plants for birds too, because they eat the seed heads or they nest in them, use them as escape cover, eat the insects. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to, to having these native plantings. There's a couple examples. This is common milkweed. Everybody, everybody probably knows on the left. Um, and then goldenrod, may, maybe not your favorite plant. Uh, a lot of people think they're allergic to it, but they're not. They're not there's not anybody allergic to goldenrod pollen. Um, but that's a, a good late blooming, uh, late blooming perennial. Uh, this is uh, butterfly weed or orange milkweed, uh, and this is a good nectar source and a caterpillar food plant for monarchs. But but a good nectar source for a variety of butterflies has a better growth habit than, than the common milkweed. It grows more like a shrub um, rather than a single stalk. So it's more handy for landscaping situations in some cases. Uh, this monarch is actually on uh, wild bergamot, or if you took five years of French like I did, bergamot, um, that uh, is Monarda fistulosa. It's a, a good native plant. It attracts a lot of swallowtails as well. Hummingbirds like it, that long tubular shaped flower. Um, you know, you have to have a, a, either a proboscis or a long beak. To, to use that really long tongue to, to use that uh, nectar source. Here's my thistle picture, <laughs> but this is a, a, a spice, spice bush swallowtail on a, on a thistle getting nectar from that. And you see them a lot on roadsides, you see a lot of thistles. And this is actually New England aster, but there are other asters. And then in the Southeast, you know, you have additional ones, but um, this is a good plant for the fall migration for monarchs. Um, it's just a prolific flowering plant. Um, it's purple, butterflies are attracted to purple. Um, and so it's, uh, you'll see just batches of monarchs and, you know, groups on this, on this plant as they migrate. 
So that gets me to, um, you know, our specific golf course program. I know it's a lot of other things, but I just want to cover some things that might be of interest to folks too, but um, especially at your, at your own home, but um, you know, feel free to type any questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. But so we call this program Monarchs in the Rough. It initially started as a, as a partnership between, between the Environmental Defense Fund and Audubon International. And we started out, um, you know, just like a lot of groups saying, oh, well, we should, we should uh, just send milkweed seed around. We need more milkweed. And then when I came on, um, I said, well, you know, we probably should provide as much diversity as we possibly can uh, and, and support other species of butterfly as well. Um, you know, if we can get other host plants in there, great. Uh, you know, caterpillar food plants in there, that's great. But definitely we want more diversity in nectar. Um, and um, so that's what we did. So we work with golf courses to create at least one new acre of habitat. This, this program is essentially grant funded. Um, so we're looking, you know, we're always looking for additional support and, um, and applying for grants all the time uh, to continue this work. We started this in 2017. So, um, and, and we had a, a continent wide rollout in 2018. And that's when we got most of the courses that we have in North Carolina um, that are involved. And at the time we were providing just milkweed and encouraging them to um, get another five pounds of a native wildflower mix to plant as a companion to that. Um, and then with some additional grant funding, some courses came on, uh, we were able to provide the comprehensive mix. So you'll see different things out there on the landscape. Like if you go out there and you visit these sites, some might have just milkweed, some might have milkweed and whatever they bought, and then some might have what we sent them. <laughs> so it's just, it's, you know, we're trying to treat everybody the same, but when it's grant funded, it's a little tough. Um, so we're always looking for support. Um, so, I mean, butterflies generally, across the board, everybody's heard about the monarch decline 90% in the last 20 years, um, which is drastic, but butterflies have declined by half since the 1980s across the board. So you think about, you know, anybody on here that, you know, was born when I was or before, there were twice as many butterflies when you were a kid as there are now. That's disturbing. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know how else to put that. Um, so, you know, we, get, we really need to get this habitat on the ground, wherever we can get it, as much as we can get. Um, and so now we're finding that once golf course superintendents get used to managing the native plants, um, they're scaling up on their own. So we conducted a survey last summer of uh, participants. The survey went to 536 um, superintendents, uh, some of which hadn't planted yet, some did. But anyway, what we found out from 173 respondents was that they planted 160 acres of their own, um, you know, in addition to what, what we helped with. And so we've got people that are like planning to do up to 50 acres on their golf course in the next five years. So once they get used to managing these things, and they see how they fit in their operation, they're ramping up on their own. And that's, that was the goal um, really long-term is like make this an industry standard, get people comfortable with managing native plants and then seeing where they could put them on their, on their golf course. So we're providing, the plants and the seeds just for monarchs and you know for monarchs and other pollinators and I, I talked about what we're providing and um you know these are regionally appropriate plants we're not taking seed from maine and planting it in north carolina you know we're not doing that um you know we want one we don't want any invasive species problems but two we don't want the planting to fail you know we're trying to get somebody to adopt a practice we can't have abysmal failures all over the country um you know it won't it just will fall apart and so we've been thank it's almost been like we've been in the right place at the right time because up until recently, it's been raining every three days um, across most of the country uh, when we rolled this project out. So germination rate has been fairly good. Um, but, you know, it could have easily just not rained and everything failed. So it's, it's interesting that in that way, we just happen to be doing this at a time when the weather was conducive to creating these patches. Um, and we have an opportunity with BASF, who's actually based in the triangle. Um, uh, uh, this year, um, we're looking to um, do another 15 acres or so. In, in the Southeast. And if they all come from North Carolina, that's fine. It won't hurt my feelings. Um, but because we spent a lot of time working with um, the Carolinas Golf Course Superintendents Association. Uh, we go to their go to their conference and staff a booth at that and, and talk to superintendents and golf course owners and golfers uh, about this, about these different habitat opportunities. So, so we're working with, with BASF this year to try to um, get some more acreage on the ground in North Carolina. So if you know anybody that um, works on a golf course or runs a golf course, you know, we've got this opportunity out there. And then um, so far, this is a, a zoomed out map, but so far we have 712 golf courses across the continent that have committed over over a thousand acres 
Uh, we just hit 1,020. Um, and this map can be found on monitorsinterrupt.org uh, under participants. This is my wanted poster. Uh, you don't want that a lot. But you know, why, why, why is this work important? You know, butterflies are indicators of environmental health. They're very sensitive to change. You know, they react to environmental change faster than say birds might be. They pollinate a variety of native plants. You know, the jury is still out on the major pollinator for a lot of native plants. Bees are the heavy hitter in the agricultural setting. Um, but you know, for native plants, butterflies pollinate a lot of them. And um, they serve as prey for birds and other wildlife. And then there's there's value to demonstrating this conservation contributions of golf courses like we've been talking about. You know, the golf management industry has changed drastically in the last 30 years. And they're, they're want, they generally want to do the right thing, be good neighbors, and uh, support butterflies and other wildlife as, as much as they can. So the benefits here, we talked a little bit about staff time and reducing chemical inputs. You don't have to mow these as often. You know, everybody likes looking at the flowers. You know, uh, you know, we had early on, we got some questions like, why aren't you mowing that? You know, because it is a process. It, it doesn't look fantastic in the first year. Um, it's very scrubby looking, but that's why we try to put some annuals and biennials in the mix to try to, um, to try to get flowers early and then have the other perennials come in. And then uh, beneficial insects are helping with biocontrol. So these plots are actually producing, uh, you know, predator insects that are controlling turf pests. Dr. Adam Dale, University of Florida, has had a lot of good work looking at that. Um, and then uh, the stormwater uh, abatement is, is another huge benefit of these, of these butterfly habitat programs. So these are our, our 13 courses that we currently have in uh, North Carolina, and then the Lonnie Pool course at NC State. They're a member of Audubon International and worked with BASF for their milkweed because they were doing plugs. They wanted started plants. Now, we've had people take our, our seed and grow them out to do plants uh, just because the establishment can be better and faster. Um, but anyway, so we basically range from Wilmington all the way over to Grandfather Mountain uh, with these and everywhere in between. So you, you get up around Charlotte, there's some, and, and Pinehurst, everybody has heard of TPC, Wakefield Plantation. So we, we have some, some well-known golf courses on here as well. So very excited to work with these folks. And like I said, with, with BASF this year, we're looking to you know, double the amount of, of courses if we can do that. The more you do these things, the more they, they spread. So uh, here's what a plot looks like you know, when they first start. You can remove the existing turf, you know, just cut the sod and roll it up, um, interplant with native grasses or even cool season grasses. You just wanna work on your mowing timing so you can get uh, pressure release for those plants that you do want. Um, and then, you know, we wanna make sure that people are, are um, stratifying their milkweed seed so it'll actually germinate. So you wanna have it in a refrigerator for a couple of weeks, moisten it, put it in the fridge or plant in the fall. So you have that cool period for that, the, that the plants need to um, break through their seed coat. And then, um, then there's, there were people doing chemical treatments and they would spray with an herbicide and then come back in, in a couple of weeks and spray again. And we actually found uh, fewer people were doing that than we initially anticipated through that, that survey that we conducted. It was less than 20%. It was 18% um, were actually using chemical treatments to, to do their seed bank uh, preparation, which was you know interesting information. We thought maybe it would be higher. So this site, they actually just mowed down the existing vegetation um, you know, haul that material away to expose the soil below because a lot of these plants need soil contact and light to germinate. Um, so if you're, if you're trying to seed into some thick debris like that, it won't, won't work very well. And this is what I was talking about, like in the first year, it's kind of scrubby looking. You see some, like, I think I see some goldenrod and some other plants in there that might be useful. Um, but you, that we provide these signs to let people know what's going on. Um, so it's like, why aren't you mowing that? Why aren't you doing your job? Well, this is doing my job. I'm trying to create this habitat and this is, this is why we're doing it. A little, little farther along, but just, just pre-bloom on this, we see the, the intensively managed turf in the background. This is more of like a tame prairie situation, fairly diverse site. You know, it might be talking up to 20 species or so of plants. And then here's somebody that cheated put it next to an existing, existing stand of milkweed on their golf course while they're creating the other. So people can make the connection like, oh, this is, this is why they just tore up all that grass. <laughs> you know, see why, why we're doing this. And then this person really cheated. This is a formal garden that we did not send any of the seed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was like, these, this, is, this is what our golf course is doing. It's by the clubhouse. You know, the, the site that they're restoring might be well out of play and out of sight. But a lot of people are putting, a lot of golf courses are putting the sign near the clubhouse. So uh, members can know what's going on and feel connected to the project. And we talk about best practices, you know, we want to mow once or twice a year, 
preferably when things are dormant, but you have to keep in mind that most butterflies don't migrate. So they're living at some stage, either as a caterpillar or in their chrysalis or as an adult underneath that leaf litter. So you want to you want to treat no more than a, you know a third of the area at a time. You know whether you're going to do prescribed fire or mowing. You know you want to make sure you leave some refugium for those those butterflies to remain in uh, and recolonize from. You want to avoid chemical applications. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then um, spot treat is necessary and mechanically remove undesirable plants. So if you have woody plants coming in or non-natives that you really don't want, you know, it's better to pull those. You know do mechanical removal or or cut and treat the stump rather than spraying, uh, you won't be very targeted with your applications. And we, we spent a lot of time providing educational uh, materials to superintendents about when to plant, how to deal with cool season grass competition, what to do with these invasive plants, and then driving home the idea that this is a multi-year project. There's time required for establishment. You know, it sleeps in the first year, it creeps the second year, and it leaps in the third. Um, so a lot of the projects in North Carolina are only a couple years old. So if you're able, if you go out and visit one of these sites, they might be in an early stage of establishment. So be, you know, be mentally prepared for that. Um, and then I've got some local nurseries here. Um, I know we're running a little short on time, try to leave some time for questions, but uh, just listen, you know, Carolina Native Nursery, Native Plant Nursery, Southeastern, Carolina Heritage, Native Roots, et cetera. Um, so these are places where you can get native plant material or seeds uh, if you want to do a restoration or, or for your home garden. Um, it's really handy because it's like you go farther southeast, it's harder to get uh, native plants. They just now started getting organized. But um, you do have some options uh, North Carolina. And these, these run the entire state. You know, this, is, this is from the coastal areas all the way into the mountains. And then there's state butterfly clubs. If you want to go out on a butterfly count and get better identification, see what lives in your area. There's social media groups like Carolina LEPS. LEPS is Lepidoptera is the, the group that butterflies and moths belong to. Um, Carolina LEPS is a very active group. If you have a question, like I saw this moth, what is it? Um, they can answer it for you. And then the Native Plant Society and, and other, you know, cooperative extension. There's a lot of research here. The museum, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of people that can help you um, learn more about, about butterflies and native plants. And we're on social media. Um, you know, we have a Facebook page for Monarchs and Rough. We use the hashtag um, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if you want to see what's going on, see more pictures from the field. I just included a few photos, but we, we get updates all the time across the country, um, what, what superintendents are doing and uh, how much their members like golf course pollinator projects. So there's a lot of cool, good work going on across the country and we couldn't do it without the staff. You know, we were providing the seed, but I'm not running around the country planting all these things. So it's, it's very handy to have that in-kind contribution of the, of the labor to install and maintain these plots. And then, you know, if you're curious about things you can do, spread the word about this, let people know about Monarchs in the Rough and other pollinator projects. Um, you can participate in citizen science efforts. Like we're, we're ramping up monitoring of our golf course plots through the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program. And that's through the Monarch Joint Venture. If you click on the IMMP, what they call it, IMMP uh, website, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's a little box that says new opportunity in 2020, monitor a golf course. And I've got a list of 240 golf courses on there that were relatively early plantings that we like to see, you know, what the plant response is and what the butterfly use is. So, um, you know, take a look at that if you want to get involved in some citizen science um, and then share your appreciation for the hard work that these course managers are doing making habitat. You know, come, don't be adversarial. If you want somebody to, to create this habitat, reach out, be cordial about it and see, um, see what you can make happen. You, you, you might be pleasantly surprised. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. My contact info is there. We got, I think, probably 10 minutes for questions. But, you know. So thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent job at cool stuff. Thanks, Marcus. Appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for joining and for sitting through. Yeah, I'd love to answer any questions. Can we stop the share screen or? Yeah, go ahead. Or I can do it. Maybe if I can click on it. There we go. So nice. excellent stuff. It's really cool to see that uh, really sort of unexpected places for pollinator habitat uh, are, are adopting really great environmentally friendly practices like that. Mm -hmm. And then even using them for, for outreach and education, like that personally means a lot to me that sure. these sites would even invite people to come in uh, and yeah. see what they're I mean, doing. Yeah, a lot of courses are municipal. You know, they're, they might be part of a state park um, or they might be open to the public. Um, so even private courses will have groups and guest lectures. So you, you'd be surprised about how many people actually come on a golf course 
um, just to walk, you know, um, and, and, or, or to, you know, just go to the restaurant. I mean, there's, there, these, the benefit or the beauty, one of the, one of the interesting things about these golf course projects is that they're seen by thousands of people. You know, you do a, a restoration maybe on another landowner type and maybe 20 people will see it um, on, on a tour, you know, but, but there are golfers going by these things all the time. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there, like I said, there's these, these external groups might come to a bird count or something that'll see these plots. And so it gets out there in the community a lot better, I think, than, than some restorations might that are way back somewhere in the woods. <laughs> that sounds cool. Okay. Uh, I'll remind everybody, if you've got questions or comments, you can put those in the chat box. We're keeping an eye on that and we'll pose those as we go. So Marcus, I'm going to get started grabbing questions from there to pose okay. to you. Great. Rana wants to know if there are any issues with folks other than golfers being on the property like birders. No, I don't know. I mean, the, there's a lot of people that use golf courses early in the morning or actually later in the afternoon, depending, you know, like evening that you'd be surprised that um, a lot of, a lot of these golf courses have residential communities associated with them. Um, they're like a, they're a development uh, include encompassing uh, a golf course. Um, and so there's a lot of trails and, and birding areas that they try to incorporate um, into the golf course and in the operation. Um, so yeah, there's actually like one that I've, I've been to uh, in Florida, they have a, they call them an Audubon group, you know, related to us as like their environmental committee for the golf course. And they, um, they produce a bird guide for people to use on the golf course. So I would reach out and uh, to the management and say, Hey, I'd like to come conduct a bird walk or, or survey. Is that possible? I mean, with coronavirus, everything's kind of up in the air, but you know, I don't, I, I think a lot of courses are fairly open to that type of activity. It, it doesn't, it doesn't interfere. It actually is an enhancement. They're always looking for somebody to clean out the bluebird boxes. <laughs> Watch out for wasps, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. You're making habitat, right? That's right. <laughs> for somebody. That's right. Uh, let's see. Gregory Scoopian is asking, does Audubon International work to repurpose or rewild defunct golf courses before they're converted to urban or suburban developments? No, I mean, we, we don't do a lot of that. We have had a couple um, reach out. One was in, one was in uh, Massachusetts, I can think of. And then one was, um, oh, I think it was in Kansas that we had recently, you know, within the last couple of years where um, the town had purchased the property and and yeah they were trying to figure out how to they were going to continue managing the golf course rather than rather than have it be developed so they put a conservation easement on it um to to reduce the development risk um and they're treating it like um a public space now but then they are going to try to manage as a golf course you see this a lot in europe um where where the municipality will or somebody will will get an old golf course and they'll completely they'll completely convert it back to a native you know a, a piece of open space but here yeah it's the development pressures are really tough and yeah we do try to keep the golf courses solvent you know with with these practices and and saving money on different inputs and things like that that they can stay open um you know with coronavirus it's the jury's still out about um how many courses may close um but we do try to work with courses to help them with their bottom line uh environmentally you know so they can they can stave off those development pressures and i think that's where there's an opportunity for solar you know um that you know there's a rental payment associated with that there might be some income where we could create habitat underneath the the um, solar solar farm um, and help infuse cash into the operation to keep uh development away uh that gregory actually posted a second question it's related to that exact topic almost or close have golf courses reported financial savings from reduced mowing less pesticides use some of the other benefits you mentioned. Yes, and we're yeah, and we're we're looking at um, we've we've applied for funding to um, conduct uh, a research project, one with NC State, um, a professor at NC State, and one um, with Adam Dale of the University of Florida. Uh, Terry Billison is in, in North Carolina, and um, with a professor at Kentucky, and looking at um, how these pollinator plots influence inputs and how superintendents adapt their management related to the the ecological benefits of those of those plots, you know, like say there's parasitic wasps attacking grubs in the turf. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking to, to find out more about that, but I, you know, we, we get told all the time that they save money, but then they automatically reinvest, you know, if employee X isn't having to mow as much, they've got them working on irrigation. So it's hard to measure, you know, they just shift their hours, uh, you know, and 
it's not reported in, in, a, in a comprehensive way. So that's why we're looking to, um, to measure it and actually, actually have a study to look at, to look at that exact question. So it's, it's a very timely question. I've got a question from Twitter for you. Mm -hmm. Here we right here. Here it goes. Uh, let's see. Do you know of any golfers being inspired to plant their own pollinator gardens or get involved in another way after seeing the enhancements on the courses they play? Yes. So uh, we've gotten a lot of one. So one golf, one golfer that I can think of um, actually pushed their, you know, took the idea and pushed their golf course to do this work. And they're going to plant 12 acres that we, you know, we're not paying for. So I thought that was pretty handy. And then, you know, we see a lot of people that are, they're seeing these plots and they'll take them to a business that they control or their own home and do a pollinator plot. I mean, it's, it's been very interesting in that way where, um, you know, people are, they're seeing these plots and they see the benefits and then they, they learn about the problem and then they, they want to do something. Um, you know, I, I think we, we hear all the time that the golf, the golfers are appreciate, appreciative now, like they're noticing butterflies now more than they did uh, before. Um, and they, they like seeing them when they're out there on the course. I was, I was wondering uh, sort of which group of people sort of drives the desire to have more natives and more insects mm -hmm. on courses. Cause me, I'm not a golfer. I haven't spent very much time on golf courses, but I think of them as pretty monoculture sure. spaces. And that if you went Logical. to a golf course and didn't see short trim grass, all the same thing. Yeah. You might wonder what you, what's up with this. Is this even a golf course? Or like you mentioned, it, it doesn't look kept. Yeah. And so many homeowners too, right? Or people who have to maintain their lawns sort of go for that exactly. look too. Everything should look kept and neat and trim. Yes. But native plants don't really play by those rules. No, they don't. But, it, you know, you can find a place where you can put them, where you can sort of keep them tame. You know, like if a formal, gar if, if, if a formal garden is your comfort zone, then you're putting these plants in a formal garden. If you want a buffer, you know, around a pond or something, that's your, that's, re, that's your space. Some people, I mean, I know there's a, um, the Garen golf course outside of Fort Smith, Arkansas, they've got 80 acres of this stuff. They don't care. They're doing a prairie restoration. So it just, it all depends on, on what your, your local, you know, what, what the management or the, the, the ownership is interested in. Like if you have a private board that, that runs the golf course, what they're interested in. And we had one superintendent that, um, maybe went overboard with it, but it was for financial savings reasons that they, he had, uh, it was like 145 acre property and he had over seven acres of pollinator habitat in play. So people were losing their balls and stuff, but, um, they, somebody won the lottery and now they can manage, they can mow and he got told to scale back, you know, so every property is different. Um, and you had, you just have to tailor this to find out what your situation is, what the tolerance level is for people. You know, some places are more old school than others, but really it's, it's coming at it from a cost. You, you have to meet people where they're at. If they're concerned about the cost, you can say, look, this is going to save X, Y, and Z on, you know, on mowing time and chemical applications and, and all this. And, and I think that um, it'll help, it'll help uh, get that conversation started. But, you know, to answer your question about who drives this, a lot of it is individuals that uh, live on or near the golf course. I mean, we talk to people all the time. There's actually one in, in North Carolina that um, the lady wanted to get her town more involved. And so she just started knocking on golf course doors, you know, went to the clubhouse and said, who do I need to talk to about this program? Um, this is, this is a great thing. And I've got a lady in California that's doing it too. Um, so it really depends. It's, it's, a, it's folks that like birding and wildflowers and, and pollinators in general that maybe retired, you know, North, you know, say someone from new England is retiring in Raleigh, you know, there, there are a lot, it's people that are, um, predisposed to being environmentalists anyway, but then there's a lot of people that are discovering that they are and just didn't realize how cool that stuff was. <laughs> it takes all kinds. So let's see, we're at one o'clock, but I just got uh, one more question sent to okay. me. So I'm going to throw this one out there too. Right. Uh, do you have examples of courses moving to more natural plantings or landscaping that better match their local habitats and climate? Yes. I mean, I, I've got examples from around the, the country. I know you probably want a North Carolina example, but um, I'm thinking like in the desert Southwest, people are with what they call xeriscaping. They're taking out all the, all the water thirsty plants and putting in drought tolerant native uh, shrubs and, and grasses and, 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 and forbs. So, you know, and then like you see a lot of 
gravel where you used to see intensively managed turf. Um, but if up in uh, like coastal areas like Martha's Vineyard, there's a big push of a course up there to do what they call organic golf course management. And they use all native native grasses and, 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 and natural pest control. And then, um, you know, there's increasingly more courses in the Carolinas. I, at the Carolina show, it was in Myrtle Beach, but it, you know, represents both states. But in, in Myrtle Beach a couple of years ago, I talked to a couple of courses that were looking into that. And especially for their, their timbered areas, you know, they wanted to do something with their pine stands that were, that were closed canopy, you know, excuse me, like how can we do a long leaf pine restoration um, in this loblolly stand, for example, um, you know, how, how can we open up, open up the canopy, get more light to the ground without causing problems with invasive plants. And so we talked a lot about, you know, what might be in the seed bank and what the past land use was. All those things are, are very important considerations to look at. But, you know, I, I think that, especially in the coastal part of North Carolina, I would say that there's, there's probably an awareness of using plants that are better adapted to sandy soil um, rather than intensively managed turf. Uh, and then in the mountains, you have to deal more with the slopes than anything else. And it's, they're more, dealing more, more with trees because you've got the relatively flat area, maybe that's in play and then out of play, it gets pretty steep <laughs> fairly quickly. <laughs> so there's a lot of native trees in that, in that instance. All right. Well, excellent stuff. Thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. It was good to be here. And I appreciate everybody tuning in and, and for the insightful questions. Everybody, I'll remind you that uh, you can find out about upcoming programs from social media and from the web. You can visit the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. They're always tweeting about their upcoming programs, and you can find out more about all the stuff they've got going on. They're at North Carolina EE. You can also follow the museum. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, you can probably just do a quick Google for the NCEE Office Lunchtime Discovery Series to see who's coming up next week. Uh, I think I have an email in my inbox about next week's program, but you know what you can do is click subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel and then click the bell to get notified. And when we post new videos and go live on to YouTube, you'll get a notification and know what's happening. And then you can tune in. That's easy, right? Just subscribe to your favorite museum YouTube channel. That's all you got to do. Marcus, once more, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. And again, thanks to the folks at the Office of Environmental Education, to the digital media team at the museum for helping us put this on, as always. And uh, hey, we'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>